Hello, welcome to the session of Artist Talks that includes four amazing presentations. First, Aaron Oldenburg will present Night Walk Through, Asynchronically Networked Space, which discuss the creation of different software objects that communicate with one another. Then Lucy Solomon and Cesar Bayo will present Mycorrhizal Insurrection, Rerouting Anthropocentric Sociotechnical Systems, where they speculate on the possibility of post-anthropocentric futures. Following that, we have Clea Waite presenting Navigating the 4D Space-Time of Climate Change, Teaser Eyes that explains an embodied experience of climate change, time, scale, causes and effects. Finally, Brian House presents Macrophones, listening, listening to the climate crisis via atmospheric infrasounds, which explores the impact of infrasounds on climate change. A big thank you for you, for the authors, for sharing such interesting projects. And thank you everyone for coming as well. So let's enjoy the presentations. Hi, my name is Aaron Oldenburg. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these um, games that I've been working on that I would that I've been calling night walks. Um, it's a, actually a series of what could be called software objects, some of which are interactive, some of which are not, and they all connect to each other asynchronously through a private server. So it's sort of a sprawling game experience where the the objects talk to each other in sort of hidden ways based on things you do or don't do and um, these go to a server and then other software objects draw that information and they take that and they interpret it in abstract ways. All right, so in the first of the series um, you're in a, a virtual reality environment and you are on a balcony looking out over a landscape and um, at some point you realize you can reach into the landscape which kind of opens like water and you pull things out um, and it doesn't give you it doesn't initially give you a sense of what those things are what they're related to but uh, this was my first experiment with sending information based on what you did to the server um, to be used in other games so this action of reaching out um, into this landscape and the and the feelings you know around this environment um, there's this um, sense of isolation uh, you're you're sitting on a balcony your neighbors are sort of far away from you in silhouette um, I've given them these sort of listless movements through motion capture but you are also looking out at this strange landscape that um, you know, I think at my time, at the time I, I began this, uh, you know, there was a feeling of impending doom and dread, but there also might be this, uh, this sense of, um, this sort of positive sense of shared experience of the strange and unknown. <laughs> um, because of course, as we, as we work on these things over the years, our, our feelings change. Um, and, uh, you know, um, possibly some uh, some isolated pandemic uh, feelings happening in there but also I think I think um, the sort of shared experience in isolation connects this to um, my previous work Desert Mothers which was uh, sort of a meditation environment where you're in a, the same space but internally you start to go other places so there's that movement between the, sh the, the, the communal and the, the, the isolated and the extremely individual, um, which I think I kind of started on, it's a path I kind of started on, um, and uh, 
<laughs> as I as I you know pause and look back and and redirect and and talk about this, um, I learn you know uh, I learn where I'm going. <laughs> so. Um, so the second in the series, I think, is ha is the strongest as far as imagery. If I were to abandon this project completely and just um, stay with one one part piece of it, it would be this one. And uh, what this began as it began as an experiment in taking this data from the server and interpreting it. Um, in sort of a dreamlike way. So basically, this this is not directly interactive. In the initial conception, you could say it's indirectly interactive because you can interact to, interact with it by interacting with the other software object, the other virtual reality software object. This pulls information from the server and it changes these and rearranges these vignettes based on the data it's getting. And so these vignettes are, uh, you know, I started off drawing from my own past photography and uh, taking apart these landscapes um, and you know there's there's you know obviously the way I feel about these pictures as I'm drawing them <laughs> and uh, but I, 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 I tried to strip a certain amount of that away I think through the, the uh, anonymizing process of the drawing and the recombining um, but there's certain, there's different elements on different layers that come apart and recombine. And I think through that process and through the types of things that I selected, there, there's this sort of, again, this, I think, idea of this shared experience of instability and the unknown, um, through the re recombining in the way I think it, it almost feels like the the nature in here is is taking over again. And obviously, some images are are stronger than others, and uh, you know, with this procedural way of recombination, sometimes uh, things are somewhat awkward in the way that they're laid out. And I don't know whether to necessarily move toward that or try to find some balance. All right, so another part of my process was going and, and bringing in a couple of earlier projects that um, were failed projects or they, they were unfinished, and, uh, but there was, there was still something that I thought was interesting about them. Uh, one of them is this non-visual game where uh, the landscape is activated by the sound of rain, which was inspired by a John Hall quote. So then this AI framework became, uh, became sort of the groundwork for new entities that are inspired by the data that's coming from the server to become a part of the player's world in this game. And probably eventually I'll have actions that the player performs go in this audio-only game, get sent back to the server in some way or another as well. It's kind of a, it feels like kind of a never-ending process this sort of back and forth where things keep changing and being revised. And so <clears throat> I've gone more towards a, a somewhat more streamlined process where, and, and this is the, what I've started on and not, not, not totally um, gotten to the end of this, but, but all, of the, all of these games that, that I've shown so far send their information to the server. Even the non-interactive one sends its randomized data to the server. And then I have a final, I have a fifth in the series that will take all of that 
um, and incorporate it into its behavior and its experiences. So this fifth one that I'm working on um, is a self-playing game. Uh, it takes the form of an interactive narrative. Uh, so the interactive narrative is streaming past the screen and you're following a character that's based on this book I was reading called Lost Person Behavior. It's a handbook for finding people who are lost in the wilderness and it talks about the kinds of different behaviors and strategies that different kinds of people have. And um, part of this work is applying those behaviors to this character and um, the experiences that this character goes through <clears throat> will be drawn from the data from the server. So, so um, some of the dreams from the non-interactive 2D vignettes will, will turn into the dreams of this character uh, as, as they wander. All right, thanks for listening to me talking about my meandering artistic process and hopefully you got some, had some thoughts about how uh, inter making your artwork interconnected in this way can serve as a sort of artistic uh, constraint as well as inspiration. Thanks. I am Lois, one half of Cesar and Lois, also Lucy H.G. Solomon. I am Cesar Bayou, the other half of Cesar and Lois. Today we're talking about a project in process, Michael Reisel Insurrection. In this artwork, we are attempting to reroute anthropocentric socio-technical systems. Our proposal is an AI that collaborates with and learns from mycelia. Yeah, this installation, Micro Horizon Insurrection, is, is the combination of a body of work in which we, we integrate pre-human logic and post-human logic that we consider as pre-human logic or microorganisms intelligences and post-human intelligence as AI in our technological systems. Our goal in this project in Mycorrhizal Insurrection, the art installation, which we are planning and in the process of building for the Mercosul Biennial, which premieres in September 2022. The premise is considering how mycelial logic, non-human logic, might reroute anthropocentric technologies and the kinds of machine-based thinking and processing that has continued our trajectory into a climate crisis. As an art collective, we've been working in projects that attempt to unite human and microbiological systems to rethink, to, to criticize, the relationship that uh, human societies, uh, mostly modern human societies, establish with ecosystems and how we try to control and to take over nature. And in these projects, we try to connect technological systems like um, social networks, AI, the microorganisms, uh, intelligences, in, and put them in relation to human networks. Our works are interactive, so people can collaborate with our works. And in the case of microrhizome insurrection, we are reading uh, the communication, the signaling from fungi, from, from mycelia. So we translate these electrical signals from mycelia to signals that the computer can understand. And an AI responds to these signals and editing texts that people can interact with. So, and we call these signals electromyceliograms. 
that we read and then we, we interact with with mycelia by changing humidity light and sending electrical signals as well this is a project that builds on a series of projects including thinking like a mushroom in which we have grown mushrooms within the substrates of books ranging from landscape design books to classical philosophy texts specifically books that attempt to ascribe an order and a human classification to non-human environments and beings this project uh, talk a lot about anthropocentrism and, and try to criticize the idea that mankind is the center of the values or the only being to be considered in terms of moral or ethics. So this um, non-anthropocentric thinking tries to displace this idea and to challenge the classic idea of what a human being is. And we question that through asking questions like how can uh, human beauty AI ultimately conform non-human logic systems and ecosystemic values? That is one of our pivotal questions. Why? is artificial intelligence so frequently focused on the human brain, on neuroscientific processes, and this reward and punishment system of logic that exacerbates many human and societal issues that exist within our uh, broader system of global capitalism. When we think about this critique, we also are really thinking about different theorists, including Jason W. Moore, who has talked about what he terms the planetary proletariat that is collectively exploited, including ecosystems and peoples. And so part of our intent is to reconsider technology's source the source logic as beyond human and more connected to the environment and to entities that exist in systems and networks that really are cohesive. Um, one of the most uh, important thing for us in terms of challenge this anthropocentric idea of what a human being is or what should be or what is the relationship with the ecosystems is challenging the idea of intelligence. What, uh, what is an uh, intelligent being? Fisarum polycephalum grows within a network and can solve mazes and also interestingly supports each node of its network and does not try to surpass or overgrow the individuals within the network. Another past work in which we explore how non-human logic can reroute human thinking is degenerative cultures, in which Viserum polycephalum grows over texts that specifically come out of this modernist tradition, including texts by Cicero, where Cicero claims that only humans can be in control of nature. And those texts become gradually altered through the growth of Fisarum polycephalum as the organism, also known as slime mold, grows over and obscures aspects of the text. Gradually, this text that is tweeted becomes obscured and changed. This new project that we're working on now, Mycorrhizal Insurrection, really is part of this larger body of work of growing organisms over human texts. And in this particular project, we are trying to make a conceptual and technical leap of joining the myceliograms, the connections, the signaling of the mycelia directly with the functioning of a machine that is communicating with people. 
With these works, we, we try to imagine an ecotopian future in which a human collective intentionally moves away from the celebration of the human exceptionalism that was built along the modernity and that still drive our decisions as uh, individuals and societies. With that, we want to imagine this future, a future in which human and non-human entities can work together and talk to each other and, and shift the understanding of what means to be human, what means to be alive. We also look to the diversity of ancestor cultures and indigenous relationships with ecosystems and language associations that pose other kinds of relationships with non-human entities and in particular Robin Wall Kimmerer's evocation of this word pupui which signals how mushrooms are about to come out from the earth. There is a lot of knowledge that exists and is buried in languages that are gradually becoming less known. And technology, as pervasive as it is, needs to know new languages. And we think that mycelia provides a direct pulse for another non-human, much more environmentally conscious and responsive logic. Hi, I'm Clea T. Waite and I am an intermedia scientist, artist and experimental filmmaker. My work examines the material poetics emerging at the intersection of art, science, and technology. My immersive cinematic works engage with embodied perception, dynamic composition, and central interfaces, and they're centered on the themes of climate change, astronomy, particle physics, history, feminism, and popular culture. I'm acting as director, cinematographer, and mathematician on this project. Hi, I'm Jared Christopher Kelly. I am a new media artist imagining and building speculative tools with sculpture, video, electronics, and physical computing and virtual environments that help map the intersections of both the physical world, our internal world, and hyper-real simulations of both. I am a developer on this project. I'm Max Orozco. I'm a creative technologist with particular interest in human perception, embodiment, and the formulation of our self-image. I see immersive technologies as a new means to engage the body and mind, educated by my career in neuroscience research. I'm a contributing developer on this project. Hi, my name is Caleb Foss, they, them. I'm a media artist working primarily in creative computation. My work explores the power dynamics embedded in familiar media technologies. Uh, I'm a professional lecturer at DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois. I worked as a contributing developer on this project, working uh, primarily on the procedural geometry. Today we'll be talking about our work in progress, Tesserice, which is a four-dimensional immersive VR mediascape in hyperspace, enacting the space-time of glacial ice from within a four-dimensional tesseract. It is an embodied documentary poem revealing the space-time effects of climate change on the ice from within 4D space. Virtual reality is uniquely positioned to visualize four-dimensional cinematic space. The three-dimensional time-based space and embodied navigation of VR creates a supra-dimensional environment. VR provides a unique opportunity to experience higher dimensional landscapes and acoustic cinematic environments from within the fourth dimension. In Tesserice, participants will propel themselves through the four-dimensional space-time of Earth's polar ice. The stark imagery of ice we use serves as a distinct access point into the overwhelming complexity of climate change and its ramifications. The Tesserice mediascape constructs an embodied poetic experience of climate change data, time, scale, causes, and effects. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. 
and it's a disaster that has moved in slow motion for decades. Until now, the slow pace and planetary scale of change has abstracted and obscured immediate comprehension of the now near climate catastrophe. How can we imagine a new way to represent the mountains of data of planetary scale change measured in a century? We might start by looking at Earth's cryosphere, imagining each of the frozen poles as a four-dimensional space-time archive of atmospheric history. Ice cores drilled from glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica contain layer after layer of Earth's climatological data, providing 800,000 years to compare our current epoch against. The geological provides a glimpse of time as a superdimensional force, a four-dimensional perspective that subsumes both past and future, and whose deep time view far exceeds human perception. Every individual life plays a small role in the history of the world, just like a single snowflake in forming a glacier. We are challenged to see beyond our immediate surroundings, envision our effects on distant parts of the world, and grasp the scale of our collective impact. Tesserites will bring the human into the space-time of glaciers, creating an immersive, embodied experience on the effects of climate change. Reality is a hypervolume of past and future matter. The present moment is a continually shifting, metamorphosing, three-dimensional shadow of this hypersolid as it passes through our space. Visible evidence of this space-time polytope is our perception of changing states over time, rusting metals, geological strata, coral reefs, and melting ice caps. The world that we inhabit has three directions to it. Up, down, side to side, forward, backward. Our world consists of three orthogonal dimensions laid out along the construct known as the Cartesian coordinate system, X, Y, Z. Visualizing fourth dimensional architectures from the confines of our three dimensional space is a question that continually challenges mathematicians and artists alike. Most solutions envision these structures observed from a distance rather than experiencing them from within. These are shadows of shadows. We're seeing a fourth dimensional object projected into 3D space and then rendered on a 2D plane. So there's a kind of reduction of information. But in virtual reality, we can explore that 3D projection and watch as it morphs around us as the fourth dimensional geometry rotates in space. Motion is essential for comprehending a four dimensional object from three dimensional space. As a result, the tesseract, as perceived from three space, has an inherently cinematic nature. We use the notion of the cinematic tesseract to formally explore supradimensional immersive cinema. Linear narrative is augmented by spatial simultaneity, engaging multiple vectors of physical participation and perception. Our approach involves considering narrative as both time and space faceted into simultaneous streams distributed in cinematic architecture. No hierarchy, no explicit viewing direction or pathway dominates the flow. Instead, the narrative is composed as an open work, a work in movement in the sense advanced by philosopher Umberto Eco. He described the open work as, I quote, a work of art stripped of necessary and foreseeable conclusions. The open work is a prepared field of possibilities for the unpredictable performance of the beholder. We aim to create an explicit connection to a poetics of space with this work. The vast space of a glacier contains deep time. Tesserice brings human perception into the superdimensional space-time of glaciers. The participant enters a crystalline tesseract composed of different scales, locations, and speeds of polar ice. The images of tesserice present hyper-realistic, magnified views of ice taken at all scales, from the microscopic to the planetary. In tesserice, the participant is free to walk through walls and along floors, ceilings, and time within the four-dimensional space, following the true geometry of the tesseract. Their movements propel them through hyperdimensions along the four axes of this tesseract, 
x, y, z, and w. In immersive cinema, immersive sound plays a critical role as a key sensory component of defining space. For Tesserice, we have recreated a 9.1 surround sound mix in VR, experimenting with how this immersive soundscape behaves in a four-dimensional navigable space while adding essential additional spatialized information cues to the immersive experience. Humans are existentially confined to the third dimension in our physical world. We can challenge these experiential limits with immersive technologies, creating interactions that defy physics, three-dimensional space, and linear time. A three-dimensional cinematic and navigable space of virtual reality is uniquely positioned to visualize four-dimensional space-time. VR provides an opportunity to geometrically construct an embodied experience of the fourth dimension from within to experience the shifting landscape and acoustic environment of fourth dimensional space from within the Tesseract. We live immersed in the meta dimensions of a redefined world, full of strange data vistas that surround us in manifold crystalline perspectives. Within this super dimensional reality, glaciers are crystal tesseracts, three-dimensional containers of Earth's environmental time. Tesserize fosters a relationship between the space-time of the human and of the geological, bringing human perception into the space-time of glaciers. The artwork examines our culture's altering perceptions of space and time, the deep time of Earth's environment, by using virtual reality to present polar ice as a unique four-dimensional window onto issues of climate change. Thank you to everyone who contributed to this project financially, uh, scientifically, creatively, and otherwise, and thank you very much to ICEA for having us. Hi everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be in conversation with you all today. Uh, remote as it might be. My name is Brian House. I'm an artist and an assistant professor uh, in art at Lewis and Clark College in Oregon. And this is a photo I took of my street here in Portland uh, last September as a massive wildfire burned at the edge of the city. Now, these years have certainly been challenging for many people for many reasons. Um, but near the top of the list for my family, uh, was this time when we had to evacuate our home because it had become too difficult to breathe. And given my privileged position, this was the first time I've felt the climate crisis. Now, of course, climate change is a trend, not any one given event. And that makes it difficult to perceive directly and unless we're in the midst of some specific calamity like this. And even then, we have to make a conceptual leap that links what's happening to us locally to the global situation, especially when that situation is not just a matter of weather per se, um, but the increasing precarity of so many people's lives and their livelihoods. Media does its best uh, to let us know what's going on in the world, whether that be the UN report on climate change, pundits on cable TV, uh, or even disaster porn circulating on Instagram. And there's the conversation that happens uh, via likes and shares and posts and through email or over Zoom or whatever. And even if you're like me, you make use of networked sensors and satellites to track air quality nearby and around the globe. So, in fact, the central feature um, of our contemporary media condition is that we're able to relate at a distance. However, I wonder if this is an overdetermined sense of the global that results. So saturated with anxiety and yet disconnected from the immediate sensorium of the body in space. Uh, that it ends up being more of a means of alienation from the planetary condition than it is of resonating with it. 
And that's not even to mention how our media infrastructure and the capitalist and colonialist projects that built it are themselves implicated in precipitating the crisis. So the question is, how else are we able to sense at a distance? And that's been the subject of my artistic research. What you see here um, is, in essence, a very large microphone, or rather uh, what I'm calling a macrophone that I've built uh, here near campus. And if a microphone is a device that's used to amplify small sounds, a macrophone captures very large sounds and makes them audible. And by large sounds, I mean sounds that travel through the air with wavelengths as long as several miles, right? And, and therefore, those frequencies are far below what human ears uh, are normally capable of registering. And this is known to science as atmospheric infrasound. Because infrasound is not absorbed by the atmosphere in the same way that regular sound is, it can travel vast distances, so even all the way around the planet. Okay, so what makes atmospheric infrasound? Well, it's superstorms, heavy industry, wildfires, uh, calving icebergs, HVAC systems at massive data centers, uh, avalanches, ocean waves, crumbling infrastructure, um, and all sorts of weaponry. And so in other words, it's a host of phenomena uh, inexorably entangled with the climate crisis. And as such, it's not easily separated into categories of human versus non-human. Here's an infrasound sensor in Greenland uh, deployed by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. And it's monitoring for illegal warhead tests around the world. So this is actually a Cold War technology uh, that I've appropriated and enhanced with some recent signal processing and, and machine learning techniques. And the original concern was to look for exceptional events in microbarometric data, uh, not to listen to our infrasonic soundscape. But that's exactly what I want to hear. So this render shows a complete installation where we have three microphones um, providing the capacity to position remote sounds spatially. And the audience listens uh, from the, a bench in the center. And that design reflects the fact that ideally people listen to these sounds while they are physically present uh, at the microphones. So that what is being heard are the same air pressure fluctuations that are in contact with the body. These are augmented reality headphones that track the direction you're facing. So the sounds you're hearing from the microphones are positioned according to where they're actually coming from. And this situates the listener in what I think of as an expanded local that extends our sense of the immediate beyond its typical perceptual thresholds. And so that means I may not be able to see a distant storm or a data center uh, without turning to the internet or to a TV. But with a microphone, I can hear it. And I'll, I'll play you a sample recording now. Um, what you'll hear is a soundtrack that's always around you, but which is typically imperceptible. Okay, here we go.
I'm not going to identify the sources of all those sounds that we just heard. Uh, and in truth, many of them remain a mystery to me. But that's actually part of the point. Because when it comes to the climate crisis, we already know the causes. And we may already be enduring the effects. Um, and, and to a very meaningful degree, we're even capable of forecasting the cost of further political inaction. But as the, the late philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy put it, um, to listen is to be straining toward a possible meaning that is not already accessible. And so in this case, to listen with a microphone is to position oneself within any given moment and attempt to sense a planetary catastrophe on a geophysical or anthropophysical level uh, in the midst of its becoming. Thank you. <laughs>